Hi everyone, welcome back. In this video, we will learn about vaporization and I'll introduce the concept of vapor pressure initially, but then we will focus mainly on quantifying how much heat energy it takes to vaporize a mole of molecules um, and also discuss a little bit about condensation as well. So let's go ahead and get started. So for vaporization to occur, thermal energy overcomes those intermolecular forces and produces a state change from a liquid to a gas. So we need enough thermal energy so that it overcomes those intermolecular forces that we just learned about in previous lecture videos. And it produces a state change from a liquid to a gas. Now remember, always bring it back to what we've learned before, right? And always when I'm teaching you, I'm trying to build a foundation. So we're building upon layer by layer and establishing structure property relationship, relationships from what we've learned. And so for example, if we have a substance that was really strong intermolecular forces, then it would be really hard to bring that substance from a liquid to a gas. We've got to break those molecules apart. They're really attracted to each other. And therefore, that means that the boiling point is pretty high. All right, I wanted to show you a video um, just so that you have a visualization of what it means to go from a liquid to a gas or from a gas to a liquid. I like to have these visuals um, to help you um, kind of really master this topic here. In addition, it, um, in this video, they will talk a little bit about um, vapor pressure. Um, and with uh, vapor pressure, we'll discuss that in my next lecture video, but it's in a sealed system and it reaches dynamic equilibrium. But it's, I like this video because it gives a nice um, picture of what's going on in your beaker and your Erlenmeyer flask. Hello. In this video, you will learn about vaporization and vapor pressure. Imagine water in a beaker at room temperature. The water molecules are in constant motion because they have thermal energy. The higher the temperature, the greater the thermal energy and the more vigorous the motion. However, the energy is not uniformly distributed. At any instance, some of the molecules have more thermal energy than the average and others have less. Some of these molecules with high thermal energy, if they are near the surface of the liquid, can break away and into the gas state. This process, the transition from liquid to gas, is vaporization. The opposite of vaporization, the transition from gas to liquid, is condensation. In a beaker open to the atmosphere, vaporization and condensation both occur. However, under normal conditions, that is, relatively dry air at room temperature, vaporization occurs at a greater rate than condensation because most of the newly vaporized molecules escape into the surrounding atmosphere and just never come back. As a result, you see a noticeable decrease in the water level in the beaker over several days. What happens if you increase the temperature of the water in the beaker? The increase in temperature increases the motion of the molecules, which results in a faster rate of vaporization. You can better understand this effect by examining the distribution of thermal energy among molecules. This graph shows the number of molecules as a function of kinetic energy at a fixed temperature. Notice that some of the molecules have a low amount of kinetic energy and some have a high amount. Many molecules have an intermediate amount of kinetic energy. The dotted line here shows the minimum kinetic energy required for a molecule to escape the liquid and enter the gas. The area under this part of the curve, then, is proportional to the number of molecules that have enough energy to vaporize. Now look at the same curve for a higher temperature. The curve shifts to the right, which means that the average kinetic energy is higher. However, 
Notice how the number of molecules with enough energy to vaporize dramatically increases. This increase explains why vaporization rates are so highly sensitive to temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher the vaporization rate. The rate of vaporization generally increases with increasing temperature, as we have just seen, increasing surface area, because molecules of the surface are able to break free more easily because they interact with fewer neighboring molecules, and decreasing magnitude of intermolecular forces, because the weaker the attractions among molecules, the easier it is for molecules to break free from one another. You have just seen what happens to water in an open container. The water level drops over time because the molecules vaporize away. What happens to water in a closed container? Well, initially, the water molecules vaporize as they did in the open container. However, since the container is now closed, the newly vaporized molecules cannot escape into the open atmosphere. Instead, they build up in the gas state in the flask. Eventually, those molecules begin to recondense. As the concentration of the molecules in the gas state increases, the rate of condensation increases as well. Eventually, the two rates become equal. Dynamic equilibrium has been reached. The pressure of a gas in dynamic equilibrium with its liquid is its vapor pressure. For example, the vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees Celsius is 23.3 torr. That means that if the liquid water in your sealed container is in equilibrium with its vapor, the pressure of the gaseous water in the container is 23.3 torr. Vapor pressure generally increases with increasing temperature because increased thermal energy favors the gas state, and it increases with decreasing strength of intermolecular forces because weaker intermolecular forces make it easier for the molecules to break free from one another and enter the gas state. However, vapor pressure is independent of surface area because even though the rate of vaporization increases with surface area, the rate of condensation under conditions of dynamic equilibrium does so as well. So the two effects cancel each other out. All right. Okay, so now that we have a better picture of what vaporization is, for example, he was looking at the open beaker container versus vapor pressure, um, which was in that sealed Erlenmeyer flask. And so like in my next lecture video, we'll discuss more about vapor pressure, but now you have that visual with you. All right, so let's review over some structure property relationships that we gathered from watching that video together. So as we increase the temperature, then we saw that that gives those molecules more kinetic energy and that helps to increase the rate of vaporization, where R stands for rate. As you increase the surface area, you also increase the rate of vaporization. However, if you increase those intermolecular forces, then that definitely decreases the rate of vaporization. All right, so liquids that vaporize easily are said to be volatile. So for example, if you had acetone which some of you may have worked with before. It's a key component in fingernail polish remover versus water. Now acetone actually has a higher molar mass than water. However, it has a significantly lower boiling point. So its boiling point is 56 degrees Celsius, and we all know that water's boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. And it's because of its intermolecular forces. So what is the dominant intermolecular force for acetone? Excellent, it's dipole-dipole. And what about for water? It's hydrogen bonding, which is stronger intermolecular force than dipole-dipole which is the reason why even though water is such a tiny molecule, it has a pretty high boiling point. 
and therefore we would say that acetone is a volatile solvent. So whenever I teach organic chemistry and we're in the laboratory, we use acetone quite a bit as a solvent um, and also as a very good cleaning solvent for glassware as well. And so I always tell my students, if you grab some acetone, like let's say they grab 20 milliliters to use throughout the experiment, I ask them to parafilm their glassware so that it minimizes the rate of evaporation of, of acetone, right? So we're not wasting money there, right? As all these acetone molecules go into the atmosphere. Um, so it's always something to be mindful of when you're working with volatile solvents. All right. Now, one of our many goals is to be able to quantify, well, how much energy does it take to do these phase changes, to do this vaporization? Well, anytime I have to think about directionality of heat transfer, I always try to tie it back to an application that I'm familiar with. So for me, I love cooking, right? And when I think of vaporization, I think about getting a big pot of water, on my stove to boils, so I can make some yummy pasta, right? So when I think about that, I realize, well, wow, I gotta turn my stove on. So therefore, it takes energy to vaporize molecules. And because it requires energy, is that an endothermic or exothermic process? Good, it's an endothermic process. And that means when we talk about heat energy, we're usually thinking about enthalpy, that thermodynamic property. That's a positive delta H, positive enthalpy. Now we can represent this in uh, chemical reaction notation, although it's not a chemical reaction that's taking place, right? Only a physical change. Um, but you can represent it. So you write water and indicate its state of matter going from a liquid to water gas. And I like to write heat above the arrow. And, and this is consistent to like if you were actually doing an organic chemistry synthesis, for example, um, when I was doing my doctorate work, I would run my polymerizations at like 300 degrees Celsius and I would write that temperature above the arrow to indicate that. So it requires a lot of energy for that to occur, right? So in this case here, I'm writing plus heat to remind myself this is endothermic. And I would look up the literature value. The enthalpy of vaporization for water, and it's different for each substance, so be mindful when you're looking them up that you're looking at for the correct uh, molecule. It is a positive 40.7, and always write your units down, kilojoules per mole, at 100 degrees Celsius. Temperature is going to be very important to look at as well because you would also find the enthalpy of vaporization at room temperature. So just be careful with the word problem is asking you to do. So for water, it's a positive 44 kilojoules per mole at 25 degrees Celsius. So it does require more energy to evaporate one mole of water at room temperature than it would at 100 degrees Celsius. Hopefully that makes sense. We have way more thermal energy here at 100 degrees Celsius than we do at room temperature. All right, so kind of give you another example to understand um, this heat transfer. So think about when you're exercising. When you exercise, you sweat, and our bodies are then covered in liquid water, right? And as the water evaporates, as it's going through evapors you know, vaporization here, it absorbs heat, so I'm gonna use this here. It absorbs heat from the body, and therefore that's where we get that cooling sensation. That's the evaporative cooling, okay? All right, let's talk about the opposite of um, evaporation or vaporization. Heat is actually released when a gas condenses to a liquid.
And you can think about this when you take a shower. If you close the door and you have a mirror in your bathroom, those water molecules, it's a hot, steamy shower, so you have water molecules a lot in the vapor phase and the gas phase, and then when they touch that cold mirror and they condense on, right, and kind of fog it up. So that's condensation. And when this happens, it's the opposite of vaporization. So instead of heat being absorbed, heat is released. And therefore this is an exothermic process. And that means the delta H is negative. That's important for you to remember that. And I'll tell you why. So if water is going from a gas to a liquid, then that means heat must be lost. But when you look up the enthalpy for the literature, you won't find enthalpy of condensation. It is understood that it requires the same amount of energy to evaporate one mole of water as it is to condense one mole of water. The only difference is the directionality of the heat transfer. And therefore, that just means the sign of the enthalpy. So if you were to look up the literature data, you're only going to find data for vaporization. But if you understand that in the context of your problem you are solving that it's condensation, then you just put a negative in front of the enthalpy of vaporization. So we just talked about the enthalpy of vaporization for water was a 40.7 kilojoules per mole of energy at 100 degrees Celsius. But because I'm talking about condensation, then I need to write a negative in front of that literature value. An example of condensation um, being an exothermic process can be a steam burn. So I have a clear memory from my first semester off at college, having to cook my own food <laughs> and um, I was reheating some leftovers, in fact, pasta, can you tell I love it? Um, and I opened up the microwave, I was super hungry, and I put my hand in there and I quickly got a burning sensation. It did not feel good. Um, and that's because the water molecules that were in the gas form were condensing onto my cold hand. And that's how, and that's a very highly exothermic process, so that's where I got that burn. And that's why they always tell you to wait for at least a minute before opening the microwave, right? Um, but I learned my lesson um, real quick there. All right, so I wanted to work a challenging problem with you all. I remember when I was a student, thermochemistry in general was just very challenging for me. And I think that's because, as I reflect on it, I think it's because energy is just not very tangible to us, right? It's easy for me to think about matter, um, and, you know, calculating percent yield. That's something that's super tangible. I can go into the lab and synthesize something and see how much I actually have and, you know, versus how much I should have made. <laughs> Whereas energy, it's, it's less, less easier to kind of touch. It's not something you can touch or, yeah, and, and, and kind of manipulate. So um, I think working problems and trying to visualize what actually is happening, what's taking place, um, is what was useful for me. And so I want to walk th through this problem with you. It takes about a full page, so that's why I put it on a separate page. Um, and so, and I'm going to not skip any steps. I'm going to show all my work, all my units, and discuss my thought process so you can take these skills and apply it to other similar problems. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So I'm a big believer as a scientist to write down all the data. This helps me to, if I'm like trying to solve a problem and I don't know how to start it, at least writing down the data um, maybe can jog my memory as to what formulas I need to use or what literature I need to look up. All right. So I write down my given data first and also what I need to solve for. So it says, suppose that 0.48 grams of water. So that's mass of water. I always like to identify my substance as a subscript there. It's equal to 0.48 grams. And it looks like the initial temperature of the water is 25 degrees Celsius. And it condenses on the surface of a 55 gram block of aluminum. It's really important that if you see 
any type of word that gives you a clue um, as to, in this example, for a phase change, that you highlight it, you make note of it. The fact that it says condensing will be really important for us. As we just learned, we can look up a literature value of enthalpy of vaporization um, for condensation as well. So this is really important. I will write that down. So we're undergoing condensation. And it looks like we're undergoing condensation on the surface of a 55 gram block of aluminum. So the mass of aluminum is 55 grams. And the initial temperature of that aluminum is also 25 degrees Celsius. All right, and so it is also saying and kind of reiterating what we already just learned that heat is released during that condensation. So heat is released, that exothermic process, and it's important to also make note that it goes only toward heating the metal. Now this is a completely hypothetical situation. I think initially when students try to tackle this type of problem, they start to think about, well, won't that heat like dissipate into the surroundings, like to the environment? And it's like, technically it would, but read the problem carefully if there's any kind of assumptions we're making um, to also simplify the math and the context of that problem. So the assumption we're making here is that the heat from the condensation that's released goes only towards heating the metal. Okay. Now it's asking us what is the final temperature of the aluminum block. So I'm going to write my need and the final temperature of aluminum is equal to what? Right? It's also giving me some other um, piece of information here that the specific heat capacity, we always, when we learn this in first semester general chemistry, we, use, we represent that as little c, of aluminum is equal to 0 0.903 joules per gram degree Celsius. And remember to always write your units down. You'll see why that is. It's very important so we don't make a mistake. All right, so I'm going to come back and think about uh, when we solve thermochemistry type problems, it was really important us, for us to remember the law of conservation of energy. And that basically states that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. And the way we can represent that is we can say, well, if we have heat energy of the system, and remember heat energy is represented by little q plus heat energy of the surroundings is equal to zero. We cannot create heat, we cannot create energy nor destroy it. You can rearrange this formula to say Q system is equal to a negative Q surroundings. So if you can solve for one of these quantities, you can solve for the other. Now the important part here is identifying what's your system and what is your surroundings. So come back here. I'm gonna imagine and I am no artist by any means. <laughs> so I'm going to um, Imagine my little aluminum cube, and I have my water molecules nearby in gas phase, and they're going to condense kind of on the surface of my aluminum block, and it's going to transfer heat energy into that block, and therefore that block is going to warm up. And I always suggest this for you. When you're doing um, problem solving, if you can just draw it out, you don't have to be an artist to do this, but if you can try to draw it out and try to picture what's going on, um, then I always find when students do this, they tend to be more successful. It's They realize like, oh, okay, I now can visualize what's going on and know how to start this problem now instead of being stuck and, and going at a blank there, right? So try to draw it out. 
Um, when you're practicing your homework, I suggest you do the same so you get very comfortable with it um, and engaging that part of your brain um, to help you understand this material. All right, so heat's transferring into the block from the condensation of the water molecules. What do you want to de um, define as your system? Yeah, I defined it as the aluminum block. I felt like that block is a system and therefore my surroundings are those water molecules, right? That's important that we identify um, our system and our surroundings in that context, right? Good. All right, so let's go ahead and see if we can solve for the heat energy of the water, right? So heat of the water. Now, water is undergoing condensation, and so I'm gonna write down, well, it's undergoing a phase change. And to quantify the amount of heat energy um, that will be lost during condensation, we use the formula, the moles of the water times the enthalpy for that phase change. So for example, here, we're working with condensation, which is the opposite of vaporization. Right, and this is what we would look up. Right? We would to look that up, and if on an assessment um, you need this information, that will be provided for you. Um, so no need to memorize it, but as you're practicing your homework problems, you may need to look up that value to help you solve for that problem. So let's go ahead and solve for the moles of water. Moles of water are equal to 0.48 grams. We got that from our given. And we need the molar mass of water. And so the moles of water um, is 0 0.026637 moles. And remember, we do not round um, in the middle of a calculation, but I like to keep track of my significant figures. And so if I had to round here, how many sig figs would I need to round it to? Two. And so I always like to underline where it should be rounded to if that was the final answer um, so I can keep track of significant figures uh, throughout the problem and round at the very end. All right. So we also recognize that we need the enthalpy of vaporization. Now we are at what temperature for water? Excellent, 25 degrees Celsius. So when we look up enthalpy of vaporization for water, it was a 44 kilojoules per mole, which, um, is it positive or negative for condensation? Excellent, it's a negative value, very good. So let's go ahead and plug in what we know, 0 0.026637 moles of water. Write those units down, don't skip out. 44 kilojoules per mole plus, I find it so satisfying to cancel units out. I'm like, yes, there we go. <laughs> All right, so then the answer um, I got for this is a negative 1.17203 kilojoules. Important to write those units down. You'll see why in a minute. And you can go ahead and you can um, underline, you know, where you would need to round it to. It looks like it would have been two sig figs, so round here. Fantastic. Now, I also recognize now that eventually I'm going to need to use this literature value here, which is in joules. But I'm in kilojoules here. Whenever you're working problems, that's why I always emphasize to you all to write down your units um, so that you don't make the mistake of not um, being consistent, right? If you have kilojoules and joules and you're trying to solve for a problem, you're gonna get the wrong answer. You need to be in the same units. So I'm gonna go ahead and convert this to joules. So I'm gonna go here. How many joules in a kilojoule? A thousand, good. And so that's a negative 1.17203 times 10 to the third joules. I'm gonna highlight this because um, I know I'm gonna use it in a second here, right? It's an important value we just calculated. There we go. Okay, so coming back, we saw that the um, Q of aluminum, 
So we're eventually trying to solve for the final temperature of aluminum. So we're going to come back and solve for the heat energy of the aluminum is equal to negative Q water. So that's negative times a negative 1.17, um, 203 times 10 to the third joules. And that's a positive 1.17, 203 times 10 to the third joules. And I'm hoping that makes sense. Always ask yourself, does this make sense to me? Uh, <laughs> this is it's, it's logical. Um, so we said and we defined that the heat lost by the water is the heat gained by the aluminum. So aluminum should be gaining heat. And so, yes, this makes sense. It's a positive value that reinforces what we already know. All right, so aluminum, coming back to that block, is it undergoing a phase change? No, it's staying as a solid metal. And you would have learned back in first semester general chemistry that to calculate um, like the heat energy for, a, you know, a, especially if you were studying metal blocks, for example, you would use the formula, like my students call it, MCAT. The mass of the aluminum times the specific heat capacity of aluminum times delta T. So MCAT is a good way to remember. So if you have a substance that is not undergoing a phase change but a temperature change, then you use MCAT. And if you have a substance that's undergoing a phase change um, but not a temperature change, then you use the moles times the enthalpy. So let's go ahead and plug in what we know. So we have 1.17203 times 10 to the third joules is equal to, and from our given, the mass of aluminum is 55 grams times 0 0.903 joules per gram degree Celsius times delta T. And it looks like we have you know, two sig figs um, here. And when we rearrange to solve for delta T, I got 23.59867 degrees Celsius. This was multiplication and division, so you would round to the fewest sig figs if you round it at this point. I'm not going to round just yet, but I would underline that that's where I would have rounded if I reported that value. But I'm trying to solve for TF, so I'm going to write in a different color so it stands out. The change of anything is always final minus initial. So final temperature minus initial temperature. And we just calculated delta T, so I'll plug that in, my formula. And the initial temperature of the block was 25 degrees Celsius for aluminum. And so the final temperature is 48.59867 degrees Celsius. Now when it comes with subtraction, you always round to the least decimal places. So in both cases, it's to the ones place. And so your final answer would be rounded to the ones place and that would be 49 degrees Celsius. There you go. So let me just summarize what we did. Remember when you do any kind of problem solving, write down your data. Write down your given, write down your need, maybe any literature data that will be helpful to solve the problem. Remember with any thermochemistry examples um, and word problems, you always write down the law of conservation of energy and identify what your system is and what your surrounding is in, in context of the word problem. If you have a substance undergoing a phase change, then you use the moles times the delta H. In this case, it was delta H of vaporization, but we will learn in a future video that if you're doing melting or freezing, then you look up the delta H of fusion. And we also learned that if something's not undergoing a, a phase change, but rather a temperature change, then you use the MCAT. Okay. And then we were able to solve for the change in temperature of the aluminum, and from there we were able to pull out what the final, 
final temperature would be, which is 49 degrees Celsius. So a lot of times when students work this type of problem, their mind is blown because they're like, why is this block getting so hot if we're at 25 degrees Celsius? This, that wouldn't normally happen. And, and you're right. It would not normally happen. However, this is a hypothetical problem, assuming that all the heat release from condensation only goes towards heating the metal. Okay. And just my um, advice to you is anytime you're doing a word problem where you need to visualize what is happening, then try to just draw it out. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time.